Hello, and welcome to the second part of this series on the private rented sector in the United Kingdom. I'm Jake McKee, your Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the National Landlords Association, and today we'll be taking you through all the aspects of setting up and maintaining a tenancy in Wales. So this will be for a landlord who wants to get started on their tenancy in Wales, someone who wants to refresh their knowledge, or perhaps someone who wants to advance their knowledge in a certain area. As there's quite a lot of legislation, and especially in Wales, there's some unique legislation in flux, it's important that we take a look at these um, and see how you can incorporate that into setting up a tenancy. So breaking down the agenda, which is what we'll cover first, we'll look at the pre-tenancy so this will be looking at serving your gas safety certificate and all of the sort of key documents that you'll need to set up your tenancy. We'll then look at preparing your property, which will cover things like keeping it in working order. We'll look at how to set up a tenancy properly and look in particular at the legislation that you need to follow and need to be aware of. We'll then look at maintaining a tenancy. So this will largely focus around products that you can utilise to make it successful, tenant communication and how you can stay on top as a landlord. And then finally, we'll have a couple of slides that are dedicated to ending a tenancy. So this will be largely dependent on whether you want to renew the tenancy, whether you want to end it or whether you want to do something else with your property portfolio. Moving on to the legal overview, if there's anything that you really need to take away from this guide, these bullet points, whilst they may appear an intimidating list, um, contain the most important provisions that you need to abide by and your legal responsibilities. So the first thing we'll look at is make sure that you register with Rent Smart Wales and make sure that you or your letting agent are licensed by them. Obviously, as the national body required to let out a property, it's critical that you are registered with them. So RentSmart Wales is essentially a national licensing body which all landlords in Wales have to be registered with. So the enforcement powers within the legislation have now been activated according to the Welsh Government. So this means that RentSmart Wales and its local authority partners across Wales can now take any action to make sure that those who need to comply do so. So it's important you should know how you need to sign up and how you can comply. So you should do that. If you haven't done this, you should do it as soon as possible. If you start the process immediately and make good progress to comply as soon as possible, it's unlikely that any enforcement action will be taken against you. So it pretty much is acting in good faith. So you can start your Rent Smart Wales application online. So you must create a user account on their website. And once that has been created, you can then complete the following, depending on your circumstances. So you can either complete a landlord registration. So that will be a legal process where the landlord has to provide contact information, details of the rental properties in Wales on domestic tenancies that they rent out, and also pay the registration uh, fee of £33.50. And this applies to all landlords in Wales. So this should be done first, and then any licence required should be applied for. Next, you'll need to complete a landlord license application. So this applies only to landlords who let and manage their own rented accommodation. So that licensing will involve completing training um, and application and paying the license fee. So that will be £144, considerably cheaper than local schemes in England, may I add. Completing an agent license application is also the final thing you can do. So if you are an agent letting out a property, this will apply to commercial letting and management agents or anyone who lets and manages on behalf of the landlord. A checklist on how to complete an agent license application can be found on their website. So if you need further guidance on any of the registrations that I've mentioned, it will all be there for you. So with every act that comes into force in the private rented sector, there's usually a big section titled Enforcement and Rent Smart Wales is no different from the others. So the implementation of enforcement measures will be inevitable. Rent Smart Wales' enforcement team is currently working with its partners across Wales and they will be working on seek and find projects to identify landlords and agents who are not complying with the legislation. This proactive activity, according to the government, will initially target high-risk parts of the sector. So there are consequences of committing offences under the Act, and these include a fixed penalty notice of either £150 or £250, rent repayment orders, rent stopping orders, criminal prosecutions and fines. Furthermore, landlords 
will not be able to serve a valid Section 21 notice for possession of their property unless the property is registered and either the landlord is licensed or the landlord uses a licensed agent to let and manage the property. So to avoid these measures being taken against you, you need to take action as soon as possible in order to comply. So the next thing you'll need to do is always abide by the provisions in the upcoming Renting Homes Act. This is essentially the Welsh equivalent of the Tenant Fees Act, which has come in on the 1st of June in England. The deadline for this is, well, likely, uh, to, you're likely to be watching this when this has been enacted. So it's the 1st of September, and it's fast approaching at the moment. So obviously the Welsh Government have released the guidance of their long-awaited Act, um, and the NLA, thankfully, has compiled an FAQs on the website, and we've compiled summaries of any of the most frequently asked questions um, into kind of a handy guide, and we'll be going through this um, to sort of help you get up to speed. So if you do have any questions about this guidance um, in a sort of wider sense, or if there's anything covered here that you need clarification, you can email me at policy uh, at landlords.org.uk. With it coming into force on the 1st of September, um, the next thing you'll need to know is that unlike England, that the ban will not be retroactive. And so the Act will apply when the term of the existing tenancy agreements have finished and a new tenancy agreement is entered into. And unlike England as well with their tenant fees ban, there will be no transition period at all. Um, for things like early termination of tenancy, the Act does not prohibit any agreement that a landlord and tenant may reach should the tenant wish to leave the tenancy early. And similarly to England, the landlord or agent can't evict a tenant using the Section 21 eviction procedure until they have repaid any unlawfully charged fees or returned an unlawfully retained holding deposit. Also, as a really important point to point out, there is currently no limit on the deposit cap. So this will allow landlords to choose the amount of deposit, unlike in England. However, the Act does give the Welsh Government the power to impose one at a later date. Having spoken to the Welsh Government, they're using, uh, this, sort of, they're using this period uh, to see how things go in England um, and see whether they want to implement one. We'll have more detail on this by the beginning of next year. So the regulations also allow specific permitted payments. So if you have a pen and paper handy, um, this would probably be quite useful to use it. Those of you familiar with the English fees ban already probably won't be too surprised by this list as many of the provisions are similar. But as a rule of thumb outlined in their guidance, uh, anything not permitted that I say will be prohibited. So it will be a useful rule of thumb for you. Permitted payments are rent, uh, security deposits, your holding deposits, uh, that will be refundable and capped at one week's rent. Uh, payments in default, so payments due for late payment of rent or where a tenant has breached the tenancy agreement. Payments in respect of council tax, payments in respect of utilities, including Green Deal loan repayments, payments in respect of a television licence and payments in respect of communication services. And as a quick note as well, Welsh ministers do intend to make regulations which will set out a list of the information that must be provided to a tenant before a holding deposit can be taken. This means the guidance will be updated in due course. Uh, having convened with the Welsh Government on this, it really does seem to be early next year, uh, as there's quite a lot missing so far in the Act uh, that we've commented on. In another, uh, another key point as well, right to rent has also been excluded from the government um, as, Welsh, uh, as Welsh politicians are currently unsure whether it will ever be rolled out in Wales. So right to rent is completely up in the air. So unlike England, uh, where it's compulsory to carry out a right to rent check, it won't be so in Wales for the time being. So default fees and late payments are still currently subject to consultation and the definitions for all of these and what the payments will be and if there'll be any caps will be made by secondary legislation likely later this year or the beginning of next year. So the Act will be commencing without any definitions or limits for late payments. I know this isn't helpful um, and so it's all yet to be seen on calculation and charging and if there will be any caps like in England. In regards to the new standard occupation contracts that are coming in uh, with the Renting Homes Act, 
uh, so far. It's not the most comprehensive piece of government guidance um, on the new rental contracts and how this will interact with the Renting Homes uh, Act. But the Act does refer to standard occupation contracts throughout, but as ASTs have yet to be replaced by standard occupation contracts, the guide states that any reference to standard occupation contracts should be read as a short as assured shorthold tenancies. There are also some provisions relating to rent increases. So similar to England, the guidance outlines that rent increases must be reasonable, which is the same guidance used in the Section 13 notice. So the guidance that will address the following uh, scenarios for rent increases in periodic and fixed term contracts. So if we take a fixed term tenancy, for example, a tenant with a fixed term contract can only have their rent raised during that contract if there is a clause in the contract which allows for a rent review. So be aware of that and ensure that you put it down in writing if you have a fixed term tenant. For periodic tenancies, tenants who are renting on a month to month basis may be given a raise in rent once a calendar year. So tenants must be given at least a month's notice of any increase or more if tenancy periods are longer than a month. So in addition, you will not be able to front load your rent. This is uh, pretty much identical to England um, in this regard. So you will not be able to charge a higher rent for the two months of the tenancy to replace any fees you would have charged prior to the ban. However, a permitted rent variation will be allowed. So we will be asking the Welsh Government for clarification on this issue by providing more examples of permitted rent variations, as there's quite a large range of tenancies this could cover. Uh, for holding deposits, uh, as is outlined, um, similar to the tenant fees guidance in England, a landlord or agent may not have to repay a holding deposit if that amount is to be put towards either the first payment of rent or the security deposit for that tenant. The landlords can also withhold or retain the holding deposit in the following circumstances. So the first circumstance would be if the tenant has provided false or misleading information when applying for a tenancy. Uh, or another uh, point would be if the tenant has failed to enter a tenancy agreement or fails to take reasonable steps to enter a tenancy agreement. And finally, in regard to holding deposits, it's important to note that for the term misleading, a landlord or agent would need to be content that a tenant was clear of what was required of them, but had failed uh, to make the necessary steps as agreed or prove that they intended to deceive rather than just making a human error, for example. So for default fees, uh, the regulations will be similar to their English counterpart, but there are just some clarifications to be had on what can constitute a default fee. So, for example, uh, missed appointments, such as a landlord arranging with a tenant for a contractor to carry out some remedial work at the property, and then the tenant subsequently refuses entry or does not allow entry, uh, resulting in charges to the landlord. So, avoidable or purposeful damage to the property is another example. Uh, replacement keys uh, is another example. So, it, this the guidance does not yet clarify, uh, unlike in England, if this applies to other security devices like uh, a garage fob or something or, or a security fob for the building. And then finally, uh, the uh, another example is emergency or out of hours call fees, uh, which is something we, in particular we stress, uh, stress to the Welsh Government that landlords uh, obviously should be able to charge for their time, especially out of hours, and that's something that they thankfully listens to us on. And then finally, another important part of the Renting Homes Act is utilities and communications. So obviously this is, a, this is always a bit of an ambiguous area for landlords and tenants, but the Act does provide some guidance on this, which is quite important. So the um, Act's guidance is practically identical to its English counterpart, um, and that is good and straightforward in the sense that any payment that a tenant is required to make to a utility provider, that can be water, uh, sewerage, gas, electricity or any other fuel, either for that utility or in connection with that utility is a permitted payment. So just take note of that. A payment towards energy efficiency improvements under a Green Deal plan, for example, is permitted if it's required under a tenancy agreement and made in respect of the dwelling subject to the contract. For things like council tax, if any payment that a tenant is required to make to a council in respect of their council tax is a permitted payment. In regards to your TV licence, 
any payments that a tenant is required to pay to the BBC in respect of a television licence is a permitted payment. And for general communications, any payment by a tenant towards uh, the TV, phone or internet is also a permitted payment. This is often an area that we get quite a lot of disputes in, so luckily the Act makes it quite straightforward. And then finally, the fun bit that I'm sure all of you will like to listen to is the enforcement penalties. Uh, so as laid out in the guidance once again, uh, the Welsh Enforcement Authority is able to issue landlords or letting agents a fixed penalty notice of £1,000 for the following offences. Requiring a tenant to make a prohibited payment, you could require a tenant to enter into a contract for services in relation to a tenancy or requiring a tenant to make a loan in relation to a tenancy. Uh, whilst whilst the list is once again pretty much identical to its English counterpart, the enforcement fines are notably a bit lower. So that will likely reflect uh, the prices in the Welsh market. Um, in terms of prosecution, there are certain fines that are uh, graded as worse, which I'll read out now. So you may get an enforcement authority that can choose to prosecute or issue issue higher fines of up to two and a half thousand pounds or an unlimited fine for requiring a tenant to make a prohibited payment. Uh, if you require a tenant to enter into a contract for services in relation to a tenancy, or requiring a tenant to make a loan in relation to a tenancy, or providing false or misleading information in relation to a notice issued seeking information. So finally as well, judges may also order repayment of any unpaid prohibited payment or holding deposit on conviction of an offence. So that's also important to note. The next part is that you'll need to ensure that you protect your tenancy deposits in a government approved scheme. So there are three main schemes, My Deposits, TDS and the DPS. The next thing you'll need to do is ensure that you can keep the property free of hazards. We'll be covering this under the Fitness for Human Habitation Act later. So after keeping the property free of hazards, you'll need to carry out gas safety checks and give a copy of the certificate to the tenants. You'll also need to ensure your electrical installations and appliances are safe. With upcoming legislation on this, which we'll go into in more detail later, it's important that you're familiar with this. Next up, you'll need to install some smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. And then finally, you'll need to ensure that your property complies with energy performance requirements. So moving on to your first pre-tenancy slide, there are some main guidelines and standards that you'll need to follow. So I've obviously taken you through the Renting Homes Act, so hopefully you're familiar with that now. But there are some other things that you should be aware of. The next is letting with a mortgage. So usually buy-to-let mortgages are used to fund the purchase of the property which is intended to be let. So if you wish to let a property with an existing owner-occupier mortgage, you must seek consent from your mortgage lender and insurance provider. You will also have some financial obligations. Letting a property can increase your income and you may be taxed, and it may also affect any benefits that you receive. So next up, you'll have some financial obligations that you'll need to comply with. Letting a property can increase your income and you may be taxed on this and it may also affect any benefits that you received. If you are an NLA member, you can use us as a resource to find out any tax obligations you may have as a landlord and how to work out your rental income. You can also use our telephone advice line to help you more in depth with any queries you may have around your financial obligations. We'll move on to some obligations for letting agents. So there are certain letting agent rules and regulations and letting agents must comply with the relevant legislation, notably the Renting Homes Act, and they must abide by business rules and regulations and any specific to their industry, which you can find on the government website. Transparency is also incredibly important, and all letting agents must publicise any fees they charge so landlords and tenants are aware of the cost of renting through that agent, and you should note that most fees to tenants will be banned under the Renting Homes Act, so this is a key thing for letting agents. If you're looking at a letting agent and scoping them out, there are, there's a checklist that you should use as a landlord. The first thing you should do is check if the agent is a member of a professional body, such as Arla, for example. You should also check if the agent is a member of a redress scheme and client money protection scheme. That is particularly crucial. You should also check whether the agent has complied with the ban on letting fees. You should also have a written agreement outlining the services the agent will provide you with and when. So just as a roundup, you should check 
as a landlord that you are registered to rent Smart Wales and have a license or your agent has a license. You must check that you have permission from your mortgage lender to let out a property. You should check your financial and tax obligations and you should finally check that your agent is thoroughly vetted. So now that we've looked at all the pre-tenancy conditions, we can now look at preparing your property. So the main guidelines and standards you should follow, the first thing you should really look at is the gas and electric appliances. You must provide a gas safety certificate at the start of the tenancy and within 28 days of each annual gas safety check. The latter part, the 28 days of each annual gas safety check, is something that landlords do miss out on quite a lot. So do take note if there is a gas installation. If you do not, you will not be able to evict a tenant using a Section 21 notice. In regards to electrical... Uh, safety, electrical installations and fixed appliances must be safe and it is recommended that checks are carried out at least every five years. Uh, th this recommendation will soon turn into compulsory legislation of the, as the government has uh, have announced for landlords that this will become law. We still haven't had uh, too much detail on this but you can check out the NLA website to stay up to date. For HMOs, it is already mandatory to carry out checks every five years. So it's just HMO regulations filtering out to the wider market. It is also recommended that you regularly carry out portable appliance testing or PAT tests on any electrical appliances you provide and supply the tenant with a record of any electrical inspections carry out. Once again, correspondence and making sure it is written is the absolute crucial foundation rule of being a landlord and ensuring that you're covered. You should also ensure that anybody carrying out electrical work on the property is competent to do so. In particular, under the compulsory legislation, it will be the landlord's responsibility to ensure that those who are carrying out electrical work on the property are competent. So you may as well get into the practice of it now. So you can find essentially registered electricians and that will uh, cover you. So now that we've covered gas and electricity, we'll move on to smoke and carbon monoxide alarms. So working smoke alarms must be installed on every storey of living accommodation. If your property has any rooms that contain a solid fuel appliance, such as a wood-burning stove, a working open fire for example as well, you must also install carbon monoxide alarms in those rooms. You must also carry out a check on the first day of a new tenancy to ensure that smoke and carbon monoxide alarms are in working order and notify your tenant. Failure to comply with this can lead to a civil penalty of up to £5,000, so do take note. Enforcement officers in your local authority can advise landlords who are managing HMOs of the fire safety requirements or any safety requirements, as these can differ from local authority to local authority. Now that we've covered smoke and carbon monoxide alarms, the next point that you'll need to take note of is energy efficiency. So you must provide tenants with an energy performance certificate or EPC. Um, there are some ex uh, exemptions for HMOs or, or bed sits where you let out individual uh, rooms. Um, but in regards to the main market, you must provide tenants with an EPC at the earliest opportunity. So... In April 2018, privately rented properties must have had an EPC rating of E for new lets uh, and renewals of tenancies, and this was given a transition period to April 2020 for any existing tenancies. So by April 2020, unless you uh, fit the exemptions, your property must have a minimum EPC rating of E. Where a property does qualify for an exemption, this uh, must be registered on the National PRS Exemptions Register. If upgrades are necessary for a property to meet the minimum EPC rating, a landlord must contribute their own funding where third-party funding is not available, up to a cost cap of £3,500. Local authorities, uh, like with uh, smoke and carbon monoxide penalties, can impose penalties of up to £5,000 for breaches. And tenants can also ask permission to carry out energy performance improvements and you cannot unreasonably refuse consent. And this is important to note. If the tenant is responsible for paying the energy bills, they can choose to have a smart meter installed. So there is lots of guidance about this available on the government website as well. Now that we've looked at energy efficiency, the next part is furniture. Furniture is fairly straightforward. Essentially, you must ensure that any furniture supplied has the required labels and fireproofing. 
Now that we've covered furniture, we'll need to cover water safety. So as a landlord, you must ensure the water it supplies in working order and carry out a risk assessment to assess the risk from exposure to Legionella. You can find out more about this in our NLA Foundation course. So just to round up as a, as a checklist of the key responsibilities, you must install working smoke alarms and possibly carbon monoxide alarms on the first day of the tenancy. You must have a valid annual gas safety certificate served at the beginning of the tenancy. You must have an EPC for your property rated E or above from April 2020 by the latest. You must ensure that furniture supplied has the required labels and fireproofing. You must carry out a risk assessment to assess the risk from exposure to Legionella to ensure the safety of your tenants. You should make sure that there are no serious health and safety hazards in the property. And there is guidance how to do this under the Fitness for Human Habitations Act, which we have a guide on on the NLA website, which will take you through everything that you need to be on top of as a landlord. And finally, in regards to your utilities and the preparation of the property, make sure you keep records to ensure you have proof that you are following the necessary legal requirements. I cannot stress this enough, particularly with landlords that we do come across who haven't had the proper correspondence noted down um, and as a result have ended up having to pay enforcement fees where they may otherwise not have been made to. So now that we've looked how to prepare your property for a tenancy, we'll now look at how to set it up for a tenancy. A lot of the points covered are straightforward, but it's critical that you know them. So the first thing you'll need to do is provide your tenant with a written tenancy agreement. It's best practice if you provide your tenant with an NLA assured hold tenancy agreement or any other form if you wish to set up another tenancy. The terms of your agreement must be fair, and if your agreement conflicts with the duties imposed on landlords by legislation, then the legislation will always override your tenancy agreement. The NLA has its own model tenancy agreements published, which can be downloaded by members for free. So with your NLA tenancy agreement, prospective tenants should be given every opportunity to read and understand the terms of the tenancy before agreeing to sign the tenancy agreement. So now that we've covered tenancy agreements and any forms you'll need, the next thing you'll need to be on top of is your tenancy deposit. So you may ask the tenant to pay a deposit before moving into the property in any case of damage or unpaid bills at the end of the tenancy. It's important to remember that the deposit is the tenant's money. So for assured shorthold tenancies created since the 6th of April 2007, the deposit must be protected by a government approved deposit scheme. So once it's protected by the government approved scheme, the landlord or the agent, if they're acting on the landlord's behalf, must protect the deposit in one of the schemes within 30 calendar days from the day the deposit is received and must provide the tenant with details or the prescribed information of how their deposit has been protected within the same 30 day period. Failure to do so means the tenant can take you to court and you will be liable to pay them between one and three times the amount of deposit and you will also not be able to evict them using a section 21 notice unless you refund the deposit first. So now that we've covered deposit protection, you'll need to do the following, which is provide a copy of an NG performance certificate and a copy of a gas safety certificate to the tenant. So now we'll move on to the next slide in setting up a tenancy. So the guidelines and standards that will be covered in this will largely uh, focus on good practice. So the first thing you should do is keep all records of correspondence, as I've mentioned earlier. I'll keep mentioning this as it's really crucial for landlords to do so. The next thing you should do is carry out reference checks, notably NLA tenant check. So you may wish to obtain references from your tenant's former landlords or agents to ensure they are reliable. You should always conduct a credit check to confirm their financial responsibility. It's important to note that you do not charge tenants for any reference checks and you may want to also carry out some reference checks yourself. So for you can do this by asking to see your tenant's bank statements or pay slips. So after reference checks, you should also prepare and agree an inventory with the tenant. We do recommend that you clear the property of any sentimental possessions. You have the property clean to a professional standard and agree and sign a full inventory with the tenants, including photos that are time and date stamped. This will be crucial for your records of correspondence. You should also provide your contact details. And make sure that the tenant has the correct details for you or your agents, including a telephone number they can use in case of an emergency. 
So in some situations, you may want to ask someone to guarantee the tenant's rental payments. This is common in the student market, for example. If you do this, bear in mind that for sharers, you may need to make it clear which tenant they are providing the guarantee for. And then the final part is following the Equality Act of 2010. So you must not unlawfully discriminate against a tenant or prospective tenant on the basis of their disability, sex, gender reassignment, pregnancy or maternity, race, religion or belief, or sexual orientation. So the next part of this is looking at maintaining a tenancy. So now that you've got it all set up and prepared, maintaining the tenancy is perhaps the most crucial thing for landlords. So as a quick checklist, you should make sure that you get landlord's insurance. So NLA Property Insurance provides excellent coverage for landlords, which you can look at in more detail on our website. So after your landlord's insurance, you should ensure that you keep the property in working order, in particular the supply of water, gas, electricity and heating. You should also ensure that the property is kept fit for human habitation at the outset and the duration of the tenancy as required by the Homes Fitness for Human Habitation Act, which the NLA supported. And you can read the full NLA guide on this in the form section of our website. And it's a really good guide for landlords at getting them started and understanding what fit for human habitation is. Finally, you must also maintain the structure and exterior of the property. Breaking this down, this entails the following. So you, either you or your agent or a supplier, must carry out most of the repairs. If something is not working, you can ask your tenant to report it to you or your agent as soon as possible. You must maintain any appliances and furniture that you have supplied. You must fit smoke alarms on every floor and carbon monoxide alarms in rooms with appliances using solid fuels such as coal and wood and make sure they're working at the start of the tenancy. You must also arrange an annual gas safety check by a gas safe engineer where there are any gas appliances in the property. And obviously, as a final part, you must make sure that you are licensed. I know that this has been mentioned earlier, but obviously in Wales, uh, it's important to mention that requirement again and again. As some further best practice that we find with our members, you should ensure the following. You can ensure the building to cover the costs of any damage from flood or fire. In terms of tenant relations, you should make sure that your tenants know how to operate the boiler and other key appliances. And finally, after the appliances, you must remember it is the tenant's home. You must permit the tenant's right of quiet enjoyment. You cannot access the property whenever you like unless it is an emergency and you must give at least 24 hours notice of visits for things like repairs. So moving on to the second part of maintaining a tenancy, tenant relations are obviously critical to extending your tenancy and ensuring that you get the best return for your investment. In regards to clear communication with tenants, as has been mentioned before, keeping records of any communication you receive or send to your tenant um, is critical. This can be difficult if you only communicate by telephone, for example, so it would be a good idea to use written communication such as a letter or email. As I mentioned the Equality Act 2010 earlier, the next issue is discrimination issues. Discrimination legislation means that you have a duty to communicate with your tenants in a manner that is appropriate to their needs. For example, if you have tenants who have literacy problems or do not speak English, you will need to make alternative arrangements to ensure that they have understood what you are trying to communicate. The next part is addressing problems in the tenancy, which is something that we come across a lot from landlords and our members. So in cases where the tenant is causing a problem, either by not paying the rent or antisocial behaviour, for example, you should communicate with that tenant reasonably and quickly. So when a problem arises, you will need to address it. In these circumstances, it would be best, in fact it is best, to send written correspondence to the tenant so you have a record of what you've discussed. In your letter, you should explain as a brief uh, plan what the issue is, what action the tenant needs to take to resolve the issue, and what, if any, action you intend to take. And finally, when you expect a response or reply from the tenant. You need to be clear about what you feel the tenant needs to do to resolve any issues and give the tenant a reasonable time frame in which these issues should be carried out. And if the tenant's behaviour constitutes a serious breach of contract, check that your tenancy agreement allows you to terminate the lease in these circumstances. If it does, you must first send the tenant notice to quit in writing before you can start any eviction proceedings. 
The next part of clear communication is handling repairs efficiently. Either you or your agent should respond as quickly as possible to the repairs, as this is something that we find for landlords who do manage to handle the repairs efficiently, it significantly extends the lifetime period of the tenancy and thus gives you greater returns. And finally, after repairs, if you and finally, in regards to communication, you should always engage with NLA services. We have lots of content geared towards tenant relations and how to improve them or maintain them for long periods of time. So we have plenty of blogs, articles, guides and services, including our telephone advice line, which will be able to give you bespoke advice to your issue. We'll now look at how to end a tenancy or the process of ending a tenancy. It depends really on what you want to do. Do you want to increase the rent? Do you want to keep it going into a periodic tenancy? Or do you want to issue an eviction notice? If the tenant wants to stay, you will need to consider the following. Do you want them to sign up for a new fixed term? Would you like to increase the rent? Would you like to move to a periodic tenancy? If you're using an agent to manage the property, the landlord or tenant may have to pay renewal fees. So be wary of this or you can move it on to a rolling periodic tenancy. This means that you can carry on as before, but with no fixed term. The tenant can leave at any time by giving notice, normally a month, and you can ask the tenant to vacate by giving them two months notice. This option would offer flexibility, but less security. If you want to increase your rent by agreement or as set out in the tenancy agreement, you can do this by issuing a section 13 notice. Provided the increase is reasonable, this can be approved. If it is unreasonable, it can be challenged by the tenant. You must give proper notice if you want the tenant to leave. Normally, the landlord must give at least two months notice and the tenant cannot be required to leave before any fixed period of the tenancy has come to an end, unless there is a break clause in the tenancy agreement or you have grounds for eviction under Section 8 of the Housing Act. So after you've figured out what you want to do with your tenancy, the next part is resolving and returning the deposit. If the tenant has met the terms of their tenancy agreement, then they should get all of their tenancy deposit back. You can withhold part of their deposit to compensate for any damage caused to your property, but not for reasonable wear and tear. You must provide appropriate evidence for any claim you make, and inventories are a good way to do this. You should also initiate the return of the tenancy deposit to the tenant as soon as possible, and if the deposit is required to be protected in a government-backed tenancy deposit scheme, you must return it within 10 days of you and the tenant agreeing how much you'll retain. If the tenant disagrees with the amount that you decide to withhold from the deposit, they may raise a dispute with your deposit protection scheme, and you should check the process of raising a dispute with the relevant scheme, as they do have slightly different uh, schedules or details. When resolving the deposit, the final things that you should look up are some straightforward things. The first is making sure that rent payments are up to date. Your tenant cannot withhold rent because they think that it will be taken out of the deposit. Finally, you should check that the tenant has not left bills unpaid and you should ask your tenant if they have paid the bills that they are due to pay. So there are two notices that a landlord can serve to begin the eviction process. The first is a section 21 notice. So if you want your property back at the end of a fixed term, the second is a section 8 notice, which is primarily used for if your tenant has broken the terms of the tenancy. You can either give your tenants a section 21 notice or section 8 notice, or both if you see fit. For the best guidance during this process, you should always speak to the NLA advice line if you don't know which notice to give because they can give bespoke advice to your situation. So landlords usually use the Section 21 procedure to evict tenants, giving the tenant at least two months to vacate the property. Landlords can use the Section 8 procedure if the tenant has rent arrears, has broken the terms of the tenancy agreement or one of the other grounds in Schedule 2 of the Housing Act 1988. If the tenant has failed to vacate after either notice has run out, you must apply for a court order. If the tenant still won't leave, you can request bailiffs to remove the tenant from your property. So there are certain circumstances where you cannot serve a Section 21 notice. You cannot use a Section 21 notice if any of the following apply. The property is categorised as a HMO and does not have a HMO licence from the council. If your property is not licensed under the RentSmart Wales scheme or if you or your agent are not licensed. 
and you cannot serve a Section 21 if the tenancy started after April 2007 and you have not put the tenant's deposit in a deposit protection scheme. And as mentioned earlier, you cannot serve a Section 21 if there are outstanding prohibited payments or a holding deposit which is required to be refunded under the Renting Homes Fees Act, which will be implemented very shortly. So, in our final slide, there are some services that the NLA can offer you as a landlord that you can really make use of that we've covered. You should consult with our advice line for any in-depth guidance and you can get tailored and bespoke advice to any situation, whether that's maintaining a tenancy, tenancy communication, ending a tenancy or making sure your property is compliant or, and is properly set up. You can also attend our foundation course which touches upon all of the topics here and expands on them in greater depth so you can be sure as a landlord that you're following the correct rules. You can also use NLA Tenant Check for efficient background checks of tenants to ensure that they are suitable to rent your property and this will save you a lot of trouble. You can also find out more information on NLA mortgages on the website. So finally, thank you for viewing this presentation. Once again, if you have any questions about the content covered, please do email policy at landlords.org.uk. So this is the second part of the series done on Wales, and next up is Scotland for the final part of the PRS in the UK. Thank you very much.